Hello and welcome to The Hard Questions. I'm Solomon Serwanja. On this episode, we focus on human rights in Uganda. We're privileged to be uh, hosting today Council Nicolas Opio, a human rights lawyer, and at the center of his life has been fighting for the voiceless. He has been to court. He has paid the ultimate sacrifice for defending uh, different people, including they have broken into his home. He has been arrested. He came back and he's still even stronger to push back against human rights violations. Council Nicolas Opio, welcome to the Hard Questions show. Well, thank you very much, Solomon. Thank you for having me. Nick, um, let's start there. Uh, at one moment, I was really worried about your life after the arrests and, you know, it made headlines. To date, people don't understand what really happened um, in December when you were arrested. And I thought we could just start there, perhaps. What really happened back in December 2020? Well, December was a culmination of many things. And I think to understand what happened on December 22nd, you've got to understand a series of events that happened before then. Um, beginning around about August, September of that year. We were in the middle of documenting violations of human rights in the course of the election. We had several researchers spread throughout the country collecting information about people who were being disappeared, people who were being killed, people who were being uh, tortured, and we were in a process of just documenting human rights violation in the ordinary course of our work. In August, we began to get phone calls and threats from unknown numbers asking us to back off uh, the kind of work we were doing. Now, we get threats all the time, and so we take the view that those who want to hurt you don't warn you. People who threaten you simply want you to, uh, to cow down, want you to cowardize and back off. Uh, they don't really want to, to hurt you. They are but only threats. And so we took those threats as threats we received in the normal course of our business and didn't take it seriously until September. September was the month in which the Chief Justice had just been sworn in as the new Chief Justice of the country. So on September 8th, in the middle of the lockdown, the Chief Justice invited 50 people to his house for a dinner to celebrate his swearing in. It was in the middle of a lockdown. I was privileged to be invited for that dinner. When I left the dinner, went back to my house, the night of the 8th into the morning of the 9th of September, uh, unknown people broke into my house. Well, unknown at the time, broke into my house in the middle of the night. Um, Were you in the house at that time? Yes, I was in the house. I was in the house. I believe that I was sedated because I didn't hear a thing. So for somebody to use a power saw to break burglar proofing, um, enter into the house, walk into the house, go upstairs to your bedroom, and ransack your pockets, ransack the jacket pockets uh, that is hanging near your bed, and pick phones that were on your bedside table, uh, you would have heard if yeah. nothing had happened. So I had nothing at all. I only woke up in the morning to my neighbors shouting outside at about 8 a.m. They had come out of their houses and they had seen what had happened to my house. And we quickly realized something was amiss. The night security guards claimed to have left at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, That's unusual. It's unusual. They're supposed to leave at 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, the... Neighbors didn't hear anything, but my house that was broken into as well, I didn't hear a thing. And I felt a bit dizzy. And in my mind, I thought maybe perhaps I was tired, that I have long days normally. But it was clear to me that I had been sedated and people had accessed my house. Now, we did two things, really. The people who broke into my house were uninterested in any valuable in the house, my TV and other valuable things in the house. They wanted information because they went for my computers, they went for my telephones, 
and they went for flash drives, you know, and took cameras that I had in the house. So it was clear that these were no ordinary thieves because a small memory stick stuck on the back of a TV for pirated movies, uh, they had the time to go search there and take it out as well. So there were really people who were looking for specific information. And so we needed to act quickly to protect the integrity of my information. So we did two things. First, we began to track my phones. If you're familiar with iPhones, once it is lost, you can track it. As long as it's online, you can have a live view of where that gadget is. So we quickly got another phone from the office and a laptop from the office and began to track those devices. And they showed up in a very interesting place. They showed up in Chua Road. We took a screenshot on Google Maps of the area where the, the gadgets had shown up. And Chua Road has two interesting institutions. It has the Chief Chancy of Military Intelligence and the Army Headquarters, the Ministry. But the phone was around the area where the Chief Chancy of Military Intelligence was. And so we quickly knew that my gadgets could have ended up in the hands of individuals related to or employed by that institution. So we shared that screen, uh, 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 screenshot on social media to let people know that we know where these gadgets have been taken and we have a suspicion based on where it is of the people who broke into my house. The second thing we did is that because we know that intelligence agencies are sophisticated and have uh, hacking capabilities, they could easily get past the Apple uh, uh, you know, privacy protection. And so we took a decision to wipe those gadgets. So we cleaned up all my phones, we cleaned up all my laptops and took them back to factory settings. And we reported the case to Chiwetule police station, which is the neighborhood where I live. Uh, the night security guards were arrested. Uh, it was clear that we were wasting time because nothing was going to happen to them. The file for my complaint was then moved to Kira Road police station, and I was told they would get back to me. Up to now, I haven't heard back. So that was September. Now, we went about our work, really, until about November when the National Unity Platform presidential candidate was arrested in Luka District, ostensibly for violating COVID guidelines. His arrest was responded to or sparked protests in large parts of central Uganda. The information we were getting from our researchers and monitors on the ground was that people linked to security agencies had responded to this incident with live bullets and had begun to kill people. And so we just went into action again, documenting these killings. We did two things. We visited hospitals. When there is such incidents, you go to a hospital because people who are shot are gonna seek treatment. So we began to scour around for all medical facilities in uh, Busoga sub-region, Kampala, and Masaka. And we were able to obtain photographs of individuals who were shot, people who were killed in mortuaries. We got post-mortem reports for many of the, of the victims. And really we were trying to get this because we wanted to seek accountability for what we now all agree was extrajudicial killings by state agents. And we thought we would have an opportunity to go to court. We were trying to piece together what we call persons of interest, police officers, army officers who were involved in these incidents. And we went on documenting this, this information. But the second thing we did was that we began to use open source information. People were posting on social media photographs of soldiers shooting on the streets, photographs of cars driving by and shooting people. And we had quickly uh, begun to realize that these killings took a particular pattern. First, they were targeting the urban poor. So slums and areas where 
opposition support was seen to be very strong. The second thing they were doing was they were targeting people who were mechanics. So garages, um, one incident in Lunguja of a man who was sitting with the dead body of his son in his living room and I was with him when the minister for security then said the police has a right to shoot and kill you. And he was touching the coffin of his dead son who was shot in a garage. So they were targeting mechanics. Um, the third category was people who were wearing regalia associated with the opposition. So if you're wearing a red garment, uh, it could be a barrette, it could be a shirt, it could be a dress. Uh, those individuals were being shot. Of all the cases we documented, the shootings, in our view, were not stray bullets because the point of impact was really intended to kill. People were being shot in the middle of their eye, in their forehead, in their necks, and many of them in the back, the back of their head, and in their midriff in the back. So there was motive. Any trained military person will tell you that is not a stray bullet. That is a well-trained, targeted shooting. So it became very clear to us. And we had begun to compile reports about these incidents. And on the last working day of the year, we had convened a meeting of four of our researchers who were still in the field. And, and we met at the office. The intention was to try and get the documents they have, digitize it, and keep it safe. And we're about to start the process and then went for lunch. We had gone through the documents. We had arranged them in order of dates and districts. And we left for lunch, thinking we'd come back after lunch and then digitize those documents. And we went to lunch in a local food restaurant. I love local food uh, in Kamocha. And that is where uh, we were all arrested from. That means they were deliberately following your footsteps to and, know that you yeah. were actually going for lunch. Yeah, they, they, they were indeed. Were they putting on plain clothes or they were putting on military gear? The people who made a dash to our desk and those who were deployed around the parking lot were visible men in, at least holding long guns. I don't know what kind of guns they were. They had uh, bulletproof vests and they had helmets. Many of them had disguised and covered their face. Clearly, uh, they were soldiers. And so we were a bit surprised. So I stood up smiling and asked the guy, what's happening? So one of them whispers to me and says, man, I've been told to pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, I said, you could have called me, I would have come. You know, why would you? Me, I thought you had come to pick Jamil Mukulu <laughs> with all this deployment. And he said, don't worry, you will be safe. Nothing is going to happen to you. Don't worry, come with us. So I gave him my hand, and I was handcuffed. And he asked for my car keys. They took my car as well, they took all the phones. They took my other colleagues in their own vehicles. They took me in my own vehicle and began to drive out. Describe for us what, what in the drone, what, what every one of us hears so many stories about people being put in those drones but we, we've never got a description of what happens when they are put in that drone. Here is my experience. A drone first is heavily tinted. So it's very difficult for somebody who is on the outside to see what's happening on the inside. But somebody on the inside can see outside. At least you can see outside because the tint uh, is tinted one way. When you enter into a drone, there are modified seats really. In my case, they were modified seats so that the middle uh, was left open. Uh, the seats had been moved to the side. And what you could see for the time I, I could see were guns uh, lined up uh, on the floor and on the side uh, of, of the van. And then you have the space between the people in the front seat, the driver and the co-driver seat. There's a... Uh, there's, uh, uh, an opaque glass so you can't see what's happening in front. And, and that's what, what the drone is. Okay. So after one hour, they drove us down to SIU Chireka. Um, when I arrived at SIU Chireka, the soldier who had arrested me orders me to run. 
And I said to him, I want to run, but I have this blindfold in my, in my face. If you take it up, I'll run wherever you want me to go. So he takes off the blindfold and they quickly, hurriedly push me into the cells. Um, and we were locked up in the cell for the night. Meanwhile, all our phones are taken. I asked to call my lawyers, call my family. Nobody wanted me to call anyone. Um, but, you know, apart from that, um, we were in a decent cell. I had... Um, 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 there was a bed and a mattress? There, 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 there's no bed. Come on, there's no bed in the cell. Uh, in the cell, you had blankets piled on the floor and a second blanket given to you to cover yourself. Uh, and on the extreme end of the cell uh, were washrooms with overhead showers and flowing water. Um, so we spent our first night in the cell. The morning after breakfast, we then were, I was invited to go to the to the office of the OC. So I go to the OC, he's now a retired police officer, um, somebody who really I had worked with before because I'd been there saving other people who had been arrested. And he says to me, I, you know, I'm very sorry, you know, but you're now here, you're going to make a statement. I asked if I could call my lawyers and he said, let me consult. And I don't know who he was consulting. Um, and he came back to me and says, you wait, you go back to your cell, I'll let you know. And nothing happens, nothing happens. And while I was being led back to my cell, I could see a crowd had formed outside the gates uh, of SIU Shereka. And I waved to them and they waved back at me. I was smiling, I could see uh, members of the civil society organizations. I could see members of uh, the human rights movement. So I went back to my cell and at about 3 p.m. I was then called out of the cell. Now this time, they didn't want me to walk from my cell to the office of the OC, which is really a stone throw away if you've been to Chireka. They brought a car and the car came and parked at the exit of the cell and I jumped into the car. They literally drove me for less than a minute and scattered me into the office of the OC. I think their intention was for me not to wave to the people outside and, and I went there and they began to ask me questions. So first they took a mug shot, you know, your name, whatever, I, you know, the mug shots. I gave them my name and they began to ask me questions. I said, I'm not going to answer questions unless I have lawyers. At least I'm a lawyer. I know that basic right, right? <laughs> <laughs> this time you say, I... Yeah, I said, I, no, I'm, I want to talk to you, but I can't talk to you without my lawyer. I want to talk to my lawyer. I need my lawyers. I refuse to speak and said, but you know I'm a lawyer. They know my rights. So they quickly, uh, you know, allowed me to call my lawyers. At that point, uh, Councillor David Mpanga, um, Councillor Ellison Karuhanga, um, Councillor... Um, Robert Chirunda, Stephen Tumesuje, they were just a host, a, host of lawyers. a host of lawyers who had come in to, to attend to me. They allowed me to sit with Councilor Ellison and Councilor David Dupanga. And they began to ask questions. So they really were looking for a crime that they didn't have. So first they said I didn't pay taxes. He says, your organization does not pay taxes. You're a tax of, you know, evader. You've been avoiding taxes. And so I said to them, if I'm not paying my taxes, why would the Revenue Authority give our organization a certificate of appreciation for being one of the best paying, tax paying NGOs? And that caught them by surprise. They didn't know that information because that year we had just gotten a certificate of appreciation from the Revenue Authority for being the most, one of the most compliant uh, NGOs. So they quickly ran to URA, which was not very far from Chureka. They verified this to be true. They then came back with a second set of questions saying that uh, Chapter 4, as an organization that I lead, had not been filing returns to the National NGO Bureau, and that was a criminal offense. And I said to them, we have slips that show that we have filed our returns. Admittedly, some returns were filed late because of institutional difficulties with government agencies, but we had receipts to show us returns had been filed for all the years we had been registered as an NGO. And again, came back with a third set of questions that uh, our organization had received money in grants from an American organization 
which was a proceed of crime. And indeed, in November before our arrest, every year we receive a grant from our grantors in the United States, the American Jewish World Service. They had sent to Chapter 4 Uganda $300,000, which is money we use for rent, taxes, salaries, and our work. And I said to them, uh, yeah, it is true, we received money, but this is grant we have been receiving five years previous to my arrest. When did it become uh, a crime? And that is what they eventually zeroed on and uh, charged me with money laundering. Uh, that the funds we had received from the American Jewish World Service was a proceed of crime. So our crime was to receive a, mon to receive a grant money that was the proceed of crime in the US, you know, which is quite, quite ridiculous. So they then drafted charge sheet, right? And tell me that they are going to search my house. I said, no problem. I don't live very far from SIU Chireka. You could simply drive to URA, to Nakawa, you're in my house. At about 3 p.m. on the 20, 4, 5 p.m., 23rd, they drive me to my house. And, and this is where I understood the extent of goodwill. Uh, the police officers could have driven me straight to my house, but they took the longest route they could possibly take for reasons I don't know. They drove all the way to Chira, all the way to Nigeria to go to Chiwatule. When we arrived at Chiwatule, we found two lorries of LDUs um, deployed all around the compound. I had my lawyers were there, and so they went to my house. Now, remember, my house had been broken into, and so we're doing repairs. And half of the first floor where the kitchen living room is, uh, even upstairs, the only place upstairs that was clean and neat was my bedroom. All the rest was really a construction site. And so they began to search the house and said to me that I had misled them, I don't live there. I said, then you take me to the house where I live because here is my bedroom. They, they turned my bedroom upside down and were asking for where money was. And again, using humor, I took them to, the, to my side bed table where I had a lot of coins. When you travel, you, you, you pick up a penny, you pick up a pound, you pick up a, a yen or whatever. And say, oh, the money is here. This is all foreign currency. And so they laughed, they laughed. And they had nothing to pick from my house because there was in fact nothing. They only took one file folder that was in my house. And I asked him why they were taking the file folder. He says he couldn't leave empty handed. He must take something. And so he took a file folder of an annual general meeting of Action Aid International in Ghana, the Global Assembly meeting. Mundane stuff like approval of auditors, election of members of the board, and stuff like that, and approval of budgets. That's what they took from my house. They then took it to drove, drove me back to uh, SIU Chireka. I spent my second night uh, at Chireka. It was that evening that my, my elder brother, Norbert Mao, and the former leader of opposition, Winnie Kiza, came to see me uh, alongside other family members. They brought for me um, sandals, warm clothing, and uh, and left. So the third day, now the lawyers were able to see me. I saw officials from the Human Rights Commission who were allowed to enter the facility, but were never allowed to interview me. Uh, Madame Ruth Sechindi, God bless her, uh, Ida uh, Nachiwala, and other researchers from the Human Rights Commission were there. They could see me, but they were never allowed to speak with me. Two things were clear. The instructions to deal with me were being sent from elsewhere. Wow. Not from the police station where I was being detained. And at about 1 p.m., my lawyers informed me that they had agreed with the police that I would be given a police bond. But at about 2 p.m., the director for crime intelligence turns up at the office, and in less than 15 minutes, I was being ushered into a car and driven to Nakawa Magistrate's Court. Now, while being driven to Nakawa Magistrate's Court, 
Were your lawyers informed? No, no. I mean, the lawyers, because there were so many people, once they saw me getting into a car and going, they all began to follow. And so when I got to uh, the holding cell of the court, the lawyers had come. So they heard about it. They saw me. They came to the court. Now, two things, really. If I was being charged with money laundering, the court to take me to was the anti-corruption court. But they took me to Nakawa Magistrates Court, a court with no jurisdiction, yes. to hear my case. The intention was clear, was to just remand me into prison. Uh, so they, they took me to court before um, uh, now Justice, then Chief Magistrate, Dr. Singiza, uh, who promptly remanded me to Chitalia Prison. In fact, he did not remand me to, to prison. Again, something funny happened. Because it was COVID time, the magistrate said, go and test him for COVID. If you find that he doesn't have COVID, then take him to Chitalia Prison. But the policemen didn't want to have me. I think the, the two days they held me, they were tired of dealing with people coming to see me. And they simply just put me in a car and drove me to a Chitalia Prison, um, where we arrived at about 5 p.m. Um, again, very, very nice people in prison. They were almost apologetic in receiving me in prison. And when I got into prison, two things were really important. The first was that the guy in charge of the stores says he couldn't bear the sight of me in a prison uniform, which is shorts and short sleeve shirts. Yellow. Yellow, yellow of course. <laughs> yellow, of course. So he went to the stores, got many shirts, tore them apart, went and tailored for me a trouser and a long sleeve shirt. And I was taken to my holding cell, which was uh, a self-contained room uh, with a flush toilet, a overhead shower, and um, a reading table with a mattress on the floor and bed sheets and a blanket. And, and that was my, my place uh, for the next week that I was in, in prison. And really two things were, Again, just people surprising you. The kindness of police officers, the kindness of prison warders, but the excitement of my fellow inmates, right from the court holding cell to the police to prisons. They were very happy to see me. And so I was a bit surprised and asked them, why are you happy to see me? Many of them said they hadn't seen a lawyer for over two years and that I was going to help them. But what was really heartbreaking was that people who were in this VIP part of the, of the prisons, really those who were isolation cells where people were being punished. Many of them said to me they had been without shoes, clothing, bedding. They were in solitary confinement for weeks. But the evening when I was coming, they were all given blankets, clothing, and mattresses. And so they were happy I brought for them some comfort. So that was the first night. Uh, the second night, so the second day then, um, I just decided that I was going to work whether I was in prison or not. And so I opened up a consultation process in my room, and there was a long queue outside the prison, and everybody was coming in to uh, tell me their, their problems and ask for advice. And on the sixth day of my uh, day in prison, um, a high court judge, uh, Justice Jane, Okuaka Jugo, released me on bail, released me on bail. At that time, what was going through your mind? Like, did you feel like worried or scared? When you do this kind of work that we do, you have to disabuse yourself of fear because you know that in the circumstances of this work, imprisonment is a possibility. In fact, the worst option was death. So imprisonment was not the worst option. Uh, we were expecting it. We knew it would happen at some point uh, because we were being trailed. Uh, our friends and sources in the security services uh, were telling us time and time again uh, what was happening. And so we knew this was happening. And my biggest task was to shield my mind from being broken uh, because clearly they were interested in me. All the other researchers who were arrested with me were not charged, they were released. Uh, I was the only person who was charged. 
And so they were interested in me. My major task was to shield myself from being broken and uh, just show strength. But like any other person, I had an ailing father uh, who threatened to walk from Gulu to Kampala, a 92-year-old man. Um, I had um, a very elderly mother. I have siblings. Um, but uh, so the, the, my worry was what this meant for them and how they were getting through this to see me uh, being dragged into court for no crime. I was also worried for my staff at the office because if you lead an organization, you think about the people who every day wake up and dedicate their time to work with you. I was worried about them. I was worried about what was going to happen to them. Um, and um, I was deeply worried as well for our, you know, our, our donors because people who sacrifice their income, they could have sent this money anywhere in the world, but sacrifice their income, their money to send it to us to further the work of defending human rights in Uganda, now being accused of being involved in crime, which they didn't commit. So that, that worried me too, um, but uh, um, I was prepared for it. Ultimately, did this case ever take off or it was just dismissed later on? So really what was quite interesting was that I was begging to be tried. I really was begging to be tried and I said, if I've committed a crime, let me serve my sentence now. Don't make this last longer. And my lawyers applied to the judge for speedy trial. Uh, Justice Lawrence Gidudu, uh, God bless him, was courageous enough to say to the prosecutors, you have one week, okay? If you don't prosecute this case, I'm going to dismiss it. Before the end of that one week, uh, the case was withdrawn by the DPP. Now, I must say for the first time here that uh, because I have brothers who are involved in politics, they were able to arrange for an interface with the president. And I met the president, we discussed uh, these allegations, and he was convinced that this was false. Now, when news of my release and the withdrawal of the case became public, sources in security services intimated to us, and we believe them to be true, that there were elements of the intelligence community, really who had made up all these lies about civil society receiving money for supporting the opposition, made up all these lies about uh, me involved, being involved in the campaigns of the opposition, uh, were unhappy because their lies were about to bust. And so they had conceived a plan to rearrest me in court. And this, this plan uh, was leaked to us by people who are in our sources who work with them. And the plan was to rearrest me and take me to a general court martial. Now, I didn't want to go to a general court martial. I'd been through you know, a lot, and we made a decision that I should leave the country uh, the Sunday before the Monday uh, of the formal withdrawal of the charges. And so as my lawyers went to court on Monday, I was airborne. I was uh, leaving the country to go to the United States. I had four hours to leave the country from the time we got the information about my rearrest in court uh, on Monday. And so I left the country with just a rucksack on my back to, to, go, to, you know, to, go, to, to go to the US where I was a, a scholar at risk at the Harvard Kennedy School. Yeah, the question many ask is how did Nick leave the country without a passport because you had submitted well, actually I had the my passport. passport. I had my passport. What happened was that I was scheduled to travel out of the country in the middle of that time when the case was still running. And so my lawyers applied to court. Court ordered them to give me my passport for one month. I took the passport to the US embassy to get a visa. It took much longer to get a visa. And what happened was that a second lockdown was imposed and movements were limited. Courts were not allowed to work. And so I had a visa, I had a passport in hand that the court had given me. And so I did have a passport and I left the country through Entebbe Airport using my lawful passport and the visa issued to me by uh, the US Embassy. Um, it was by sheer luck, or by 
complete sheer lack because on the morning of the formal withdrawal of the charges, there were indeed deployments in the courthouse that were similar to deployments to rearrest somebody in the courthouse. Uh, there was no other case of high profile uh, than my case. Um, my, my friends and staff and family who were in the court saw this deployment, took these pictures of cars that were parked there. The prosecutor didn't want to entertain the withdrawal unless I was present. Thankfully, my lawyers convinced the magistrates uh, that there was no need for me to be in court since the case is being withdrawn, and the case was then withdrawn. And as the case was being withdrawn, I was landing, landing uh, in Cambridge, in Massachusetts, to begin my uh, sojourn there as a visiting scholar at the Kennedy School. Yeah, you mentioned that you met the president. What was the discussion like? Interestingly, very, very candid, very candid. Um, and I said to him, whatever they were doing to me was unjustified, was unlawful, and uh, is based on lies. And so we went through the lies. Some of the lies that they had told him was that I had received $50 million and that I was using that money to finance the opposition. And I said to the president, uh, if there was some $50 million for me somewhere, I also want it because I hadn't received it. And, you know, of course, we just laughed about it. Uh, he was told that uh, I was deeply involved in the organization and planning and execution of the People Power campaign. And I said to him, no, I wasn't. I was just a lawyer for Bobby Wine. I was just a lawyer for people who were being abducted, or tortured and killed. I was not involved in the politics uh, of his campaign. Um, again, we laughed about it. And then there was all this accusation about being an agent of foreigners. And we took time to discuss the nature of global capital, to say global capital, the nature of global capital is that financing flows from the global north to the south for the private sector, for governments, including his own government, and receiving money in and of itself cannot mean that you are a foreign agent. Otherwise, all of us are foreign agents, including himself, including you know private sector that gets money from private venture capital funds in the global west. And so we laughed about it. And, and but I also said to him, I said, I'm, I'm a Ugandan with agency. To think that I'm just a pawn being used by somebody, it's just to think I'm very stupid, and that I have no agency. I am, I'm a Ugandan like anybody else. Um, and uh, I'm doing lawful, legitimate work as a human rights lawyer, and uh, I should be allowed to do my work. And so he said, okay, no problem, uh, have a good day. You know, my people here write lots of lies. Uh, have a good day, uh, you'll be fine. And so we left. It was a meeting of three people, myself, my brother, Dan Fred Kidega, the former Yala MP, uh, and the president. Nick. Maybe you got an opportunity to explain yourself. There are so many people who have been arrested on similar allegations and have gone through what you went through, some of whom are still in there. Perhaps they never get an opportunity to see the president or they don't. They're not Nicolas Opio, you know, a person who will all go and protest and do campaigns and everyone is involved. What do you think, as a human rights lawyer, what can you do for such people? The people who you left there, that man who was beaten in the, in the feet, with swollen feet there, that perhaps will never be a Nicolas Opio to, whose story like, can be told, or the nation will raise up against government if Nicolas Opio is arrested. And all of us will go, to, will go that distance to ensure that Nicolas Opio is released. Well, first of all, let me just, for the first time, express my deep gratitude to the multitude of people in this country who stood up and protested my arrest, including my local chief, wrote David Onena Chana, who threatened to protest if I wasn't released. Ordinary people took to social media to say, free Nicolas Opio. I have not been able to go through all the messages up to now because they were in their thousands, if not millions. I don't know what would have, what would have happened for me without their support. So international I owe media, local media, international media, international organizations, governments, 
uh, my my schools, you know, the the uh, you know the Stanford uh, University Center for Development and Rule of Law, uh, international organizations that I can't name all of them, Human Rights Watch, you know, everybody, uh, the U.S. Uh, government, the uh, National Security Advisor, uh, you know, who tweeted and wrote to the president about about my plight. So I'm really deeply grateful to them for their support. And this support perhaps is because of who I am. Uh, the American ambassador, the former American ambassador, ambassador uh, uh, Natalie. Natalie Brown, uh, the German ambassador, uh, the EU ambassador, you know, um, uh, and, and all the ambassadors in this country who protested my, my arrest. I'm grateful to them. Um, if you watch my trials, they were full of um, staffers from all foreign nations in the country. So I'm grateful to them. But there are thousands of other Ugandans who are suffering in silence. I spent time in prison trying to document people's stories to be able to come out and help them. Unfortunately, when I was leaving prison, they took away all my notes, all my books, I lost all the contacts of the people that I had committed to help in prison. Through other means I'm unable to disclose to you, we were able to reach some of them. And at the time I left the country, we had represented 68 of them. And they had all been released from prison. Ordinary people, like the young man, Tumusime, who used to clean the floor of my room, because to him, after every person came to see me, the floor was dirty. So he mopped it. We got him out. Uh, he's now a border border rider in Mbarara. I bought him a motorbike, uh, including people like Gerard, uh, a Mohima boy who was falsely accused from Kasese because of the ethnic hatred of uh, some ethnic groups following the massacre at Kasese. And so we dedicated our time and resources to defending people we met in jail. And up until now, we are still defending many of them. But there's only so much we can do, we can do. It is important that the human rights community takes a special interest about what is happening in the gated communities of our prisons. Nicholas, you have presented so many of these things to the Uganda Human Rights Commission. You know, cases have been presented to the Human Rights Commission. There's been several petitions there. And yet we look at the Uganda Human Rights Commission as this, this a center where, we, you know, as a center of excellence, or it's a refuge or an oasis where these violations are reported and perhaps action can be taken. Do you think that the Human Rights Commission is standing up to its expectations? Look, the Human Rights Commission has technical staff who I know to be consummate dedicated human rights defenders. Some of those have spent all their careers at the Human Rights Commission, and they do their utmost best every day to go there and ensure that they protect the rights of Ugandans. But you have political appointees and leaders of the commission whose conduct is, an, is at variance first with the mission of the Human Rights Commission, but two, with the actions of dedicated staff of the commission. The political appointees, the commissioners, over time, first, we have had a dampening of quality of people appointed as commissioners. The first commissioners of the Human Rights Commission were people of stellar record in defending human rights Madam Margaret Sekaja, nobody can question her commitment and dedication to human rights defense. Commissioners like Ali Romara, the late Father Waligo, were consummate human rights defenders. I think that the subsequent wave of commissioners, perhaps the last best commissioners we had were people like Medikagwa, the late Medikagwa. Everybody after that has been a political appointee who's record for defending human rights cannot be compared to those who came before them. Those individuals have become a problem in the Human Rights Commission because their 
not committed to tackling the difficult issues of the day. And no person exemplifies that than the chairperson of the Human Rights Commission. And so at a basic staffing organizational level, that is the problem. But there's also a third problem that is often not focused on deeply. In 2005, when we were amending our constitution, this government proposed the scrapping of the Human Rights Commission. Can you imagine? They survived being scrapped by the skin of their teeth. Ever since then, the commitment to financing the Human Rights Commission has been lackluster. The Human Rights Commission's budget is only funded to the extent of recurrent expenditure. Okay, rent, salaries, okay, equipment. But programs for the Human Rights Commission are largely funded by donors. Without these donors, the Human Rights Commission is a sitting duck. When the DGF was closed, the Human Rights Commission lost hundreds of millions of dollars in money and programming that was going into supporting the Human Rights Commission. When the UN Human Rights Office in Uganda was closed, the, UN, the Human Rights Commission lost income, lost money. And so there is no commitment from government to adequately facilitating the Human Rights Commission. There are several staff members of the commission who are living in great pain, but in silence, because they just don't understand what the leadership of the Human Rights Commission is doing. They can't speak publicly, they will, they will not be able to do so, they're civil servants, but that is the state of the Human Rights Commission, utter, complete chaos, to the extent that the chairperson now accuses other commissioners on the commission of coming into meetings with guns because they want to hurt her. That's how deplorable the Human Rights Commission has become, and I think that it is unfortunate. Do you think then the Human Rights Commission should be disbanded? because of failure to do its job? No, 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 no absolutely said. not. I think that first, this is a microsm of a political problem. A political system that thinks that human rights is an inconvenience because it makes the state look bad if the Human Rights Commission publishes uh, reports about people being killed extrajudicially by members of, of this government. And so we've got to first begin to change the narrative and the paradigm of how we appreciate human rights. That the respect for fundamental human rights is at the core of our value as a country. <laughs> if you read the preamble of our constitution, that constitution is really militating against past violations of human rights by past regimes and setting forward a promise not to go back to that dark age. And so we must center human rights first as a basic value for this country so that every intervention is human rights sensitive. It is aimed at improving the livelihoods of people in this country. The second thing is that we must move away from this sense that people who speak about human rights violations are not patriotic, don't love this country, they damage the image of the country. What in fact, damages the image of this country is violations of human rights. Because human rights is a development concern. Let's look at it that way. When people enjoy their rights and have freedoms, they're able to participate in their governance, they're able to participate in the economy, making this country a better place. So human rights is as much a development concern as anything else. But lastly, human rights is also a security concern. If I were running a state, if I'm violating rights, I am building discontent. Because the families of those you have shot and killed on the streets surely will have no reason to support you as a government. And so safety and security, peace and security of this country depends on if, how much we, depend, we defend, protect, and uphold basic human rights values. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's look at it on the flip side. I mean, that explains your arrest. Um, which is sad, I must add, because, I mean, when you I shoot mean, look, people... We are all Ugandans. We love this country. Exactly. We just think that it could be run differently in some aspects. Yeah. And if we speak about 
the ills we are seeing. It doesn't make it you anti-government. It does not make me not, and, you know, not patriotic. In fact, it makes me very patriotic because I am speaking for a better country. Because today it could be you, tomorrow it could be someone else, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And therefore maybe they need to be that mindset. One of the things that really stands up and we've seen you stand up and campaign for accountability. Um, and there's been a lack of accountability on human rights violations, especially those that are committed by um, the security forces. And several reports have come out to implicate the security forces as leading human rights violators. Human Rights Watch, uh, chapter four always releases these reports, including the Kasese massacre, which we, I mean, every, is that November, right? Mm -hmm. We remember what happened to, to, the, to the people who were killed in Kasese. And every November we all stand up and demand for accountability. And yet this information just goes to deaf ears. We know that the, the, the people were shot down in Kampala and in different parts of Wakiso. Uh, I think it was the 50 killings, people who died. I think the Daily Monitor did a spreadsheet on that, mm -hmm. uh, putting faces to the people who we lost. There's been a general cry for accountability for the violations that have been committed. Have you seen any action or have these cries from both civil society and some Ugandans been heard? The state claims that they have taken measures to punish those who are involved, for instance, in the November killings, but nothing could be further from the truth. To our knowledge, the people who commanded, who executed these operations have not been held to account. In fact, they have been praised and many of them even promoted. The same thing is true of the Kasese massacre. Instead of holding to account the commanders who were on the ground shooting and killing people, the victims were the ones who were in prison for seven years, including their king. Victim blaming. In the election case, the president blamed the victims. He says some of them were involved in riots. Some of them were beating people who are wearing NRM uniforms. Let's say that is true. Is that justification for their extrajudicial killings? Absolutely not. Internal disciplinary mechanisms are being used to mask and hide criminality and protect individuals involved in gross human rights violations. I think that we should abandon those internal mechanisms because what they did was a crime they should be charged in a court of law and accorded due process. They could be acquitted, they could be convicted, but they must be tried in a court of law. They must have their day in court. I think that we have had too many episodes of mass human rights violations that have gone on without accountability. And it is sad because those involved in this criminality have the protection of the state. But the protection of the state is temporary. If we document these cases accurately, at some point in history, these individuals will be held to account in some form or another. I strongly believe that because the protection of the state is temporary. These people who are involved in killings are cannon fodder. Tomorrow, they will be left to the wolves and they will sure have their day in court. But as we wait for that day in court, we must document accurately these violations. We are able to try people who are involved in the heinous um, Holocaust in Nazi Germany because there was an, an account, there's a record. We're able to follow people who are involved in the genocide in Rwanda 94 because there's a record. Let us document these cases accurately and let victims and their families step up to speak, to document uh, their experiences. Because at some point, there will be accountability for these individuals. Of that, I am sure. But the second thing, and this is really important, is that we must also begin to have social accountability. If you know that your father is killing people and comes back home every day, 
You should protest him. You should ask him the hard questions because you see him in the newspapers, you read him in the reports. If it's your spouse, if it's your partner, if it is your parent, you must begin to have social accountability that excludes people who are involved in human rights violation from being members of civilized societies. We cannot give them front seats in, in churches and praise them and hail them. We must begin to socially exclude them. They will feel the pressure. And I think they will pause and be able to stop what they're doing. There might be social accountability now, but there will be legal accountability in the future. Of that, I have no doubt. Of that, I'm sure. But for that to happen, victims must speak up and document their cases. And those of us who are involved in human rights work must document these cases. Because there will be a time when the protection of the state has vanished and these individuals have to face their actions. I know that you know, there are people who have lost loved ones. I got a call two weeks ago from a lady who said they shot, the, the, I think it was their daughter, killed her. They went to court. Court ruled that they should you know, compensate. Yeah. She has never heard from them. Yeah. Um, and she's just devastated because she told me, okay, so what can you do? And I'm like, okay, I'll see what I can do in my own powers. Look, uh, but she has to speak up. She has to speak up publicly. She must tell the world what's happening because the state, the attorney general and officers in his office have gone to the United Nations Human Rights Council and Human Rights Committee and the Committee Against Torture and made false representation that these victims have been compensated. Whereas not. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. Just last week, we filed three different communications to these UN bodies to say, you're being manipulated. You're being given false information. So let these victims speak up, uh, speak up, because those who are involved in obfuscating these narratives, those who are involved in lying, those who are involved in human rights violations, will get away with it unless we hear the victims speak up. So let those victims speak up and say, you've not been compensated. Because there's a human cost to human rights violations. They're not just statistics. They're families. They're children who will not go to school because their father has been shot and killed yeah. while trying to eke a living for them. They're mothers who will not get their husbands back home or husbands who never see their, their, their wives. Think about the children of Olivia Letire, a lady who was just active in opposition politics now embroiled in what is clearly an unfair process. And many others, there is a human cost to this. There sure is. Um, Nick, one of the things you got scared about is parading you before the military court martial. And yet we see civilians being paraded before the military court martial and treated differently. Um, is this something that you think the public needs to stand up against? The African Commission has been very clear about the use of military courts. Military courts are meant for service individuals, period. The trial of civilians in military courts is patently unlawful. It violates the African Charter. There's different rulings of the African Commission on this issue. If Uganda claims to be a member of the African Union of Good Standing, and respects the jurisprudence of the African Commission, they should stop trying civilians in military courts. Regardless of what the UPDF Act in Uganda is saying, the section of the UPDF Act that allows for trials of civilians in military courts have been held by various courts in Uganda itself to be unconstitutional and unlawful. But what do we do? We appeal these cases in the Supreme Court and pack them there because we want to buy time to use the military court for a political process. But if you think that the treatment of civilians in the military court is unfair, then you haven't heard about the treatment of soldiers in military courts. That is not a court. It's not a court. It is patently unfair the way they treat servicemen who appear before that court. Many of them do not get justice. We did a report for the, human, for the UN Human Rights Office about 
military justice. There is no justice in the military system for ordinary folk in the military. And I think that first we must make that court fair to UPDF soldiers who appear before it. But secondly, we must stop that court from trying civilians because there's no place for civilians to be tried in a military court. This is unlawful. I think we must all protest it. When the law society was still a vibrant law society, the law society challenged the trials of civilians in the military court. This law society must stand up to that challenge and uphold the struggles that were started by past presidents to confront military courts and stop them from trying civilians, but to also make them fair to military men who appear before it. What happened to military men is despicable. It is, it is, it is, it is Maccabi. If you hear their stories, they just can't speak to you. I was in that court and there was a, a doctor, a military doctor who was being tried for stealing COVID drugs while he was working in Mulago. The military court is trying a case of theft. Really? The elections calendar is out. We're getting into elections. Usually, the scale of human rights violations, and we're learning from history, number of violations go high significantly as we get into the elections. You think it's going to be better this time? The next election cannot be better qualitatively unless you address the questions of accountability arising from the last election. Because the people who committed these crimes will feel emboldened to commit them again. Many people who committed crimes in the last election are still in charge of the systems that they were running. So I don't think the next election is going to be any better unless you address and the question of accountability and commit to a non-recurrence. I don't see that willingness in the state. In fact, I see violence being used as a means to maintain power. Unfortunately, it is also now being used in some sections as a means to get into office. In other words, you have people who are radicalized, who now think that elections cannot deliver uh, any results and think about other means of getting into power. And that number is growing. Radicalized individuals who think about violence as a means to ascend to office at various levels. And that's why our elections are full of violence at parliamentary, at LC level, because people think that violence is the means to gaining power. So they see people in the state using violence to maintain power. They also think that violence can be used to get that power. So unless we address the question of accountability and make it risky, we must increase the cost of human rights violations by holding people to account. If you don't do that, everybody is going to think that is normal and people are just going to become lawless. I fear that the next election is going to be more violent uh, than, than the last because we haven't addressed the problems of accountability and violations that occurred in the last election. What do you think we can do right between now and the time elections really get heated up? We have two and a half years to elections. Let's use the next six months to do a proper accountability for what happened in the last election. That accountability includes charging people who are involved in human rights violation, in extrajudicial killings, people who have been involved in torture. It includes releasing all political prisoners, people who have been disappeared, must be brought back. If they are dead, give us their body. Let's bury them. Let's find closure. Okay, release all political prisoners, hold perpetrators to account, audit the process of the last election, send a strong message that this cannot be tolerated. If you don't do that, that means it's tolerable. That, would, that might include uh, revisiting the security agencies and their role in elections, arresting those who have been involved in human rights violations and charging them. And their names are known. Many of them were captured on camera doing these things. Many of them, the president threw them under the bus when he said, my commandos did a good job. Uh, in quelling the November uh, uprising. And so we've got to commit to that process now. If we don't, then we're wasting our own time in the next election. Wow. Um, do, you need, do you think that we need to have some reforms, electoral reforms ahead of elections? Could those support in, in 
protecting the population as we get to the, to the elections. That too is important. It, it, reforms at the 11th hour, history has shown us, are reforms that only help to keep status quo, not improve the quality of elections. If you want to have a free and fair election, let's have electoral reforms now. Let's have an independent electoral commission, not these placeholders that were put in place by a system that is seeking to keep itself in power. Let's have a reform of the electoral commission and process. But secondly, let's remove the army from politics. The army belongs to the barracks, not to the arena of politics. The infusion of the army in our politics is a cause of deep concern. Because a soldier is trained to kill an enemy of the state. To a soldier, the person on the other end is an enemy who must be decimated. To them, that is not a, a person exercising his inherent right to protest the government. So let's remove this lethal force, this army from politics and put them in the barracks. They can go and fight ADF and let the politicians sort out their issues politically. What a way to conclude. Nicolas Sopio, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Solomon. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Well, I've been it. speaking uh, with uh, Council Nicolas Sopio, he's a human rights lawyer and also the executive director at Chapter 4, sharing his deep insights on issues around human rights and what we can do all together. Three things stand out for me. One, you have to document these violations. If you have a smartphone and you see these violations that are being done, just record them and you know, share and share and share. And I think all of us have a role and responsibility to play. Two, that what concerns the Ugandan also concerns you because today it could be them, tomorrow it could be you and you don't find yourself in that position. And three, you may be putting on the army uniform today, but tomorrow you will not. And therefore that you will ask that we stand up for you. And if you didn't stand up for them, then we cannot stand up for you. I'm Solomon Seranja. Thanks for watching. This is The Hard Questions. <laughs>